I, I retired from psychology when we moved to Hawaii because uh, my son was in junior high school then and is really extremely dyslexic. So I became his, his reader and teaching assistant through high school. And then by the time we got through junior high school and high school, I wasn't particularly inclined to go back to being a psychologist. And so I started painting then. And then I was diagnosed with MS. My hands sometimes give me troubles and I couldn't, couldn't hold a brush without dropping it. So then I started working in fabric and I, I can do so much more with that than I did with painting. You can't mush the fabric, you can't mush the colors. I mean, the fabric is what it is and you can put it next to each other, but you can't, you can't turn it all into mud by overdoing it. <laughs> My mother was this kind of high-strung lady who didn't like to use nouns. She liked to point and she'd get very, very anxious at things. So she decided to take up teaching me to sew then. So sewing with my mother, you'd be doing, she'd say, no, 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 stop, 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 turn, turn, do this to that, that, over there, over there, do you see over there, don't do that, ah! you know, and it was, it was a total nervous wreck experience. And so I didn't know, I didn't sew for years and years and years. When I first came to Kona, I came to your shop and said, I'd like to learn quilting. Um, and Roma Mark said, why, I'm teaching a class. And I said, well, I barely know how to sew. And she said, not a problem. So I kind of learned to sew then. I found a magazine that purported to uh, teach you how to do a Lone Star quilt for the beginning quilter and you put together all of these strips in different orders and then you sewed them together. If you don't know what a Lone Star quilt is, it's a quilt that's all little triangles going out. But I guess I wasn't precise enough so when I started to put it together, none of it came together. It was just awful. And so then I cut that into pieces like patchwork and made a baby quilt for charity out of it. Yeah. I don't have a pattern that I'm working from, and I don't know where it's going to go when I start. I have a vague notion, like the one for your food for thought quilt. I knew I was going to use the fabric as hula skirts, and that I wanted the hula dancers to be going diagonally. I just start building, so I had the buffet table, and then I got all these paisley prints out to see what I could find that I could make look like food. The pellet quilt is a Hoffman fabric challenge, and the fabric itself is these fluorescent jellyfish. And the theme was, this is Hawaii. So uh, staring at the fabric, I'm looking at it, and these purple eyes keep looking out at me. And I thought, all right, purple eyes, purple eyes, this is Hawaii. And of course, that led me to Pele. I started out with a piece of just 30 inch by 30 inch white muslin put the eyes in more or less in the center of it, and then started building fabric from there. I wanted it to be kind of three-dimensional, and so I stuffed certain parts of it, and Pelly kind of came together. I always have pictures that I'm sort of working from. I take a transparency and trace around it, and then I teach them how to enlarge using a grid method to get it to the size that they want. Start out with one piece of fabric on muslin for um, the background, the predominant color, and then start adding other pieces, which you can cut off of your transparent pattern that you've made and continue adding on top and layering and sewing them down until you have a piece. And then you can try it on different backgrounds, um, either that you make or like here she is on this background or here she is on that background or here she is on the tree in my living room. Mm -hmm. And uh, then that was the one that I finished up. the quilted pet portraits that I do on commission for people, Basset Hound bed quilts that I do for Basset Hound Rescue. Let me show you the quilted pet portraits, for instance. I'll uh, work from um, photos. This was a gift for someone who uh, has worked for a long time with the dog rescue that I work with. And when she left, everybody pitched in to um, make her this, and she wanted all of her dogs and cats, which is eight of them, against a jungly background that had a pineapple in it. So... <laughs> Thank you.
Well, I actually began quilting when I came to Hawaii for the first time in 1989 and I saw a Hawaiian quilt in the store and I just was fascinated by this and I really needed to know how to do this. I'd done other kinds of needlework but but not quilting. I went into the store and talked to the owner and she had a video for sale from the lady who had made this quilt. And I looked at this video and I recognized where she was standing in the garden, figured I could figure out where she lived, and I tracked her down and <laughs> asked her to give me lessons. Her name was Konia, and she was a very well-known Hawaiian quilt artist who had studied on Oahu with some of the old masters. She gave me lessons, and then she invited me to join her patchwork club. And I had never done patchwork quilt before, but then I fell in love with that. <laughs> and so here I am. <laughs> I learned to sew when I was a little child. My grandmother uh, taught me to sew and we made doll dresses and things like that. I guess I have to say I was the black sheep in a uh, family of artists. I went to law school. And <laughs> but I grew up in a family where everybody was creative and everybody was making stuff. I lived with my uh, grandparents who were retired and my mom who was a very creative woman and my uncle who had just returned from uh, World War II and was in very ill health. My father was working uh, at the time and only could come home on weekends. So I had all these people who had nothing better to do than spoil a child and, <laughs> and make things with them. So I was throwing pots when other kids were making mud pies. They had a dark room and they de developed their own pictures. And they did woodcuts and they did painting and then as I got older my uncle grew up and got married and uh, I babysat his kids in exchange for art lessons. I had a lot of art in my life. I don't have a preferred technique. I love them all. I love Hawaiian style hand quilting. I love English style hand quilting. I love American style patchwork. I love piecing. I love applique. I love machine quilting. I'm a professional machine quilter now. There just isn't anything I don't love about quilting. <laughs> so I've got this one I brought as an example of a Hawaiian quilt that I designed. It's kind of a favorite because it was the second one that I actually designed myself. All hand quilted and it's the only one that I still have so I mm -hmm. kind of fond of it mm -hmm. and so it goes up every Christmas on the wall. Have you ever had a, a quilting disaster? Oh no there's no such thing as a quilting <laughs> disaster. You can always put a bird on it. You can always <laughs> put a bird on it, absolutely. <laughs> Alex Anderson and Fonz and Porter probably taught me most everything I know about patchwork quilting. Okay. Angela Walter and I just can't even name all their names but mm -hmm. there's so many people that are out there today that are inspiring quilters. My favorite quilt story is about the lady who was making a quilt to go in the quilt show and she brought it in on the day of the quilt show and it didn't have the binding on it. She was trying to put the binding on with scotch tape. <laughs> I'd never seen anybody put binding on with scotch tape before. And then the quilting fairies fixed it overnight. They do because it's magic amazing. and that's the magic of quilting. <laughs> I am working now currently on a series about Hawaiian legends. This one is the legend of Ohia and Lehua. Ohia was a prince, a very handsome man, and the goddess Pele took fancy to him, but he was in love with Lehua, so he refused Pele. So what she did was to turn him into a tree. Here he is in the tree, you can see his head is there and the body, and Lehua at that time was devastated just cried and cried and the other gods took pity on her and said well we can't undo what our sister Pele did but we can do the next best thing. They turned her into the flowers so that they could always be together. So you can see Lehua's face. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is another Hawaiian legend and this is the legend of the Mo'o. Mo'o are shape-shifting creatures that take the form sometimes of a beautiful woman and sometimes of a big mean reptile. This is Mo'o. They're frolicking down there in the water and here's their sister coming up and making her transition into the woman that's going to fool you into thinking that they're nice. I like to use that fuzzy yarn that they use for yarn lay. It looks like seaweed and the little shimmery net on top so it gives it the effect of water. These tea leaf here are actually little cut off leaves from silk flowers and her hair is yarn as well. I start with a full-size drawing on paper and then I take muslin 
and then transfer my drawing onto that. And then I just start layering the fabrics, appliquing them one on top of another on top of that muslin background. Haloa was the name of the first human. He was the child of the Sky Father and the Earth Mother. He had had a child, and that child died at birth. And they buried him facing the rising sun, and subsequently, not long after, had another son. And they named him also Haloa. It means breath. They gave the living Haloa the duty of taking care of the grave of his brother. And he would do that by going out and watering, weeding, and taking care of the earth around this place until plants started to grow. And the plant that grew from that seed was the kalo. In English, they call taro, that they make the poi, which is the staple food of the Hawaiian people. The story represents, you know, one brother nurtures the one who's past, and the one who's past creates life of the future. This one represents the goddess Laka, the goddess of the dance and of the forest. She's preparing for the dance, carrying her ipu, going through the forest, picking the lehua blossoms to make her lei for the dance. It's made with lace, these ribbons that are shaped like vines. I use a lot of this brown twine that was used in the roots, and it is also now used for these ferns. I've had all these different fabrics that look like tree barks, so I just kept putting them on, how they kind of looked good. And this last one is just for fun. Back last year, when the volcano was really going off full steam, at one point the lava in the caldera had gone down, and they were concerned about it hitting the water table and making these explosive things, which now we actually have found doesn't actually happen. But <laughs> they didn't know that. These are actual things that were reported in the news media. I'll read some of them because I wrote them on the back about this eruption. Why volcano escalate, threatening to shoot rocks the size of trucks, boulders as big as a school bus, and scientists warn of cow-sized rocks raining down from the sky. I call this one, Tutu Pele cleans out the garage. <laughs> <laughs>
until Auntie Catherine died and willed them to her only child, her son, which is, would be my mother's cousin, okay. my second cousin. So before he passed away, when he was sick, he called me up and he said, I have something for you. And I figured it was going to be one of those quilts. But when I got there, he gave me two of them. Mm. So you got them because there is no sense in my having them, stashing it away in a trunk. I want them enjoyed and looked at. I was just there playing underneath it and then grew into threading her needles and then teaching her. She would not let me touch it or anybody else. So I'd have to start my own. It took me years before I really got serious about it. Once I did, I can throw everything else to the wind and just do this. <laughs> I'm at it at six in the morning with a cup of coffee and I put it down about eight and try to get other things done. Then I'm right back in there again for the rest of the day. You sometimes want to design your own, which I have done before, but it's not too much fun. It takes too long. Waste a lot of paper, you spend the hours and hours on the floor and you don't like it. In the rubbish can it goes and you start all over again. <laughs> there are so many patterns available now. I have hundreds of them and we trade off. So it doesn't make too much sense to design your own unless that's what you want to do. I just like to sew. I've done a lot of Ulu quilts because they're just beautiful. And the Monsteras, I love those. Not too many people do this kind of work. You have to be a little crazy or really, really dedicated. <laughs> I teach it, hopefully, hoping that people will pick up on it. I'd rather be teaching it to young people, but they're too busy with their telephones and their whatever that machine is called. And nobody's got the time, and that's too bad because we're going to lose it. So now it's just older people and people who take the classes and they love it, but it's very time consuming. You've got to put everything down and just sit there and do it. So I love it when they come in and they say, I am so jazzed. It's just so relaxing. I sit there and I just want to quilt all day. I said, I know. <laughs> my very, very first one. My grandmother was still alive then and she helped cut it out. And I had about six friends that were in the army. So they said, get your grandmother and let's get together. So she came up one day and spent the night, two days, and the girls all showed up. She taught us how to fold them, how to cut them, how to iron it. And for two days we worked on this and they all got lost and grandma went home. So I started on my first large quilt and I got it all basted and I got it all put down, the entire piece. And I started to quilt it. And our daughter was three, I think, and we had another baby. She came up to me with one of those little toys that you pulled the string and this clock started talking, told you what time it was. And she came up and she said, Mommy, something's wrong. And she pulled the string and out poured all this battery acid, dead center of it when I was sewing it in my lap. And it was either kill her or throw the quilt away immediately. So I folded up the quilt and I went straight to the trash can, opened it up and threw it in there and closed it. I said, never to be thought of again. And went back and fixed Malia's toy. I think my mom taught me embroidery. I started sewing when I was about 10. And then she did just about everything. She knit, she crocheted, but she didn't really do quilting. So I was in my early 20s and somehow came upon a stash of fabric and I said, Mom, teach me how to quilt. And she said, oh, okay. So she taught me how to quilt. And I thought, this is great. And I said, but you don't quilt, Mom. She goes, ah, it's easy. So she taught me how to quilt. She made it up. So I learned how to quilt without a hoop, no hoop. And I, you know, she taught me right. I, I just, it worked. But then when I came here, I got into the Hawaiian quilting and I was taught with the hoop because that's how you do Hawaiian quilting. After I got done my second pillow, I went, this hoop's really awkward. I can't take this anywhere. And I 
threw the hoop out and I started doing the way my mom taught me. And I, I moved into bigger and bigger quilts and they, they worked. I got into it when I was in Volcano. Linda Smith was teaching a class and that was the beginning of it and I fell in love with it and didn't stop. <laughs> I love Hawaiian quilting. I love doing it by hand. I hand applique, I hand quilt. This is uh, Naupaka. It's Mountain Naupaka. I designed it uh, when I lived in Volcano, which is at 4,000 feet elevation. And I lived there for uh, about 37 years. And the Mountain Naupaka is slightly different. It's a tree. It's different than the ocean Naupaka. But it's got the same pretty little flower, little white flower. We actually built our first house, and we had started with a raw piece of land that was forest. I noticed in the first few years, a mountain Malpaca tree popped up all around the edge. And then after about 10 years, they all kind of died. Now, Paca is sort of the defender of the forest. It goes around the edge where you've disturbed it, and it makes a barrier. It's sort of the guardian of the forest. Well, after I was doing some pillows, some smaller pieces, I would change a leaf or add a stem or do something a little bit different and then I'd get done and I'd go now. I didn't create this, I, I used a pattern to start with and Hawaiian quilting is all about the pattern. I had to work out whose design it was and I thought well if I can change a leaf or a stem I can design my own. I did a lot of designing, I just, uh, it, designing was so much fun. With Hawaiian quilting they are a lot of work. The design has to be right. You can't change it at the end. You can't fix it. You might get it to the point where it's all appliqued and you go, uh-uh, it doesn't work. So that's why Hawaiian quilting takes so much energy in the design. So I decided Hawaiian quilts need to be done in silk. So I asked around and nobody ever had ever done one. And I checked the internet. Nobody had ever done one. I checked everything. I went on YouTube. I did every possible way to figure out how do you do a Hawaiian quilt in silk. So I went, well, now I'm going to have to invent something else. <laughs> I started practicing on little pot holders and little pieces. Silk frays. I mean, you just have to look at it and it starts fraying. <laughs> so I had to figure out how to applique this pattern and get it done before it fell apart. I finally did. You just do it the way you would do a normal quilt. And you be very careful. And you do not move your quilt. You have a little spot for that quilt to be. And whenever you're gonna applique, you sit down and you don't move the quilt. You work on that corner. And then you move it a little bit and you do a little bit more. I wouldn't call it a disaster. I just say it's like a learning curve. You get to a certain point and you go, Ah, this is not worth continuing on. And so then you give it to somebody else and they think it's fabulous. So that works. So this is my Naupaka quilt. This is the hand dyed fabrics. This is linen for the background. It's not everything you'd ever want to know about the quilt, but there's enough on the label to know who made it, where it was made, when it was made, or anything that might be useful hundred years from now because we all like to think our quilts are going to be around for a hundred years or more. If somebody a hundred years from now wants to know more about me or about Volcano Hawaii or anything, they've got a start here and they can do their research. This is Naupaka again, my, my same basic design. It has a lay on the bottom and the top. The lay doesn't go all the way around because what I wanted was a lap size quilt. I didn't want a square quilt. Most Hawaiian designs are square. If they're not, they're one quarter design instead of a one eighth design. But this was already designed as a one eighth design, so I added the lay on the bottom and the top and got a nice lap quilt. This quilt is all silk. It's Dupioni silk, of these two fabrics. This is white silk. It's silk applique thread and silk quilting thread and it has a very, very light wool bat. And the wool bat makes this like air. It's, it's so light, it would be really warm and yummy if you wanted to stay warm underneath it. I call this Naupaka in silk. I put on here who it was dedicated to because when I was doing this, I had a selection of silks and I was auditioning them and I called my husband in and said, what goes good together? And he came up with this combination. The label says the colors of this quilt were chosen by my husband, Ken, because I thought of him with every stitch, it belongs to him. This was the first quilt that I did in the color design and the one I used for the pattern cover. Uh, this is all cotton fabric and this is linen 
Well, I believe it's a mixture of cotton and linen, but it's mostly linen. And it was wonderful to work with. Absolutely wonderful to work with. Um, I like the combination. I like the weight of it. This is the mature koa. When the most times you see the tree and you see these long leaves in its little seed pods, it's just this beautiful, big, graceful, lovely tree. But what you don't always recognize or see is the very young koa, and it's a fern-like. It's a totally different leaf. You would think that it's just another fern tree in the forest, but it's not. It's the beginning of a koa. On this one, I just put koa, and it was designed by me, and I left it blank. For when I give this quote away, I can put whoever's name I give it to and dedicate it to them. This design is Pukiave. It's a little bush that grows mostly only in the upland forest, like Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Its berries are anywhere from white to pink to dark pink to burgundy, and sometimes on the same bush. You can't eat the berries, they're pretty bad. But for the nene, when they run out of ohella berries in a drought year or a famine year, they'll eat the pukiavi and they'll survive on the pukiavi. So it's their famine food. This one I, I experimented with the in, inner border, but it needed something to balance it on the outside. So I came up with a corner border or lay. I made this for my mom. She was the one who taught me quilting. She's passed on now, but it still reminds me of her.